Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the 8 Morning 92 podcast. Where we always keep it 100 with you. We're your host, Harrison. And Najee. Today, we are joined by a multi-talented man. He has been a pro career basketball player. He's also been an executive. And now he's dipping his toe into the writing world with a published book called The Black Market. We are joined today by Merrill Cole Jr. How are you doing today? I'm good, guys. How are you guys doing? Good. We appreciate you uh, joining us today. Um, a lot of stuff has been in the headline for you, but we wanted to make sure we got you on the show to highlight some of the good stuff that you've done. Not only have you uh, been able to play a game that me and Josh love dearly, which is basketball, you've gone into communities and highlighted some of the great people that uh, play this game, whether it's been Patrick Beverly, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Zion Williams, um, a lot of unknown people in the AAU, mark, uh, AAU circuit. Um, just we're working with some places like a, some of the companies like Adidas and all that. You also had your own pro career playing for them, and, and now you're dipping your toe into the writing world. How's everything been for you? Uh, it's been a, it's been a cathartic experience. You know, it's been it's been a necessary experience in terms of having a narrative um, of me and my work and my livelihood uh, put on full display and mm-hmm. in a negative light. Right. So this is my chance to kind of set the record straight and really tell the truth, because what you find out is when the government and their cronies um, want to make an example out of you, they can. And without the truth being exposed. And so this is my chance to say, you know what? You had your chance. Now it's my my turn. You were known not just as just somebody at Adidas or Nike. You were known even before you even stepped into the the um consultant world I, I go back to where you started like you have a long lineage your grandfather played in the negro league who uh ascended and had an elementary school named after your dad went by big merle was known as a beast um in the football realm and uh started and played in canada had a nightclub made himself a very successful lawyer your mom also played sports so sports played a very major um key in your life and you end up taking that with you. So how how much would you say the game of basketball has shaped who you are? Well, I think, you know, certainly it's been a huge part of, of, of who I am. But, you know, those that, that molding and shaping, as you as you very, very uh, eloquently stated. Right. It comes from a, a lineage of folks before me. It comes from my grandmother who played basketball at South Carolina State. It comes from my grandfather, who was a professional baseball player. My father was a professional football player. Um, and in my household, man, education and, and work ethic were, were prominent, right? So it didn't matter what you did, just be willing to work at it. Um, and so, so I think those, those lessons, uh, coming up in my household truly helped me become the person that I am. And it was, you know, my, I come from a family that was always about community and about giving and helping. And so I took those lessons with me as a player. Um, you know, even in the book, I, I talk about some of my college teammates who couldn't afford to eat. Well, my mother would feed us on the weekends. We drive home. We drive to my parents' house and she'd feed them. Um, some of my parents' families couldn't afford hotels when they would come to come to try to see us play. So they would stay at my parents' house. You know, so just trying just kind of growing up in that. We're trying to look out for our for for our community and our people. Um it's something that's really been ingrained in me, man, since, since I was a, a, a little dude. And so I, I've tried to take that with me and I'll continue to take that with me. And if that causes me issues that I'm currently dealing with, then so be it. But what I'm not going to do is apologize for trying to help people who are exploited and minimized um, because of a game that helps white folks make money. I'm just not going to do that. And I noticed something. You said something early in the book. You've always lived in the gray area and people like to keep things black and white. But there was also a thing that uh, I think your father said to you early in the book when, you know, you said you weren't rich, but a lot of people weren't as affluent as you were growing up. But it was a common trend throughout the book um, of shady things. And it ended up leading to things where if, if you paid attention throughout your life, it was a common trend where you always kind of had to turn the other cheek. Even with you going to Clemson, you were sold upon a dream to go there. The coach leaves and then get Rick. It works out for the better of you. So I, me personally, I feel like this will kind of do the same thing because even I'm not going to spoil the book because you all got to read. It's a great book uh, for even how this happened. This was just, I can say wrong place, wrong, wrong time. But how this was set up, you were li- literally doing your job. 
Yeah. Your, and, and I think, but so I think that's that's part of why the book is important mm -hmm. because I think what it does is it opens the the eyes of those who don't get to experience the real sports world and how it actually operates mm -hmm. from the grassroots level to the collegiate level to the pro level, right? It, it, most folks who are your g general fan just turn the TV on and watch these young men and women, women run up and down the floor or run up and down the field. They don't understand the time, the effort, the energy, um, and then the mental and physical abuse that these kids take on a daily basis. You know, and so I think that's part of the conversation. The, the book's intent was to open your eyes and help you understand. Uh, the book's intent was to make you think. It was to um, make you laugh. It was to piss you off, right? Like there, I, I hope you get all of those emotions um, from the book. And, and so when you start talking about my personal journey, yeah, I mean, it. it it's a business and this business is not going to stop. And if somebody has to pay the price um, for the business and that's how they framed my particular situation from for doing my job, um, then that's what it is. Because what, what you find, man, is that when white folks can't control something, they criminalize it. Yep. And so that's exactly what happened in my situation because they can't control young men and young women's appetite and families' appetites for equity to be equitable uh, an equitable position, excuse me, as, as it relates to this business. And so they're going to do whatever they can to survive, whether that means somebody helping them pay their bills, their mortgage, uh, pay their, their, their hospital notes, having, you know, ha having food to eat regularly, like whatever that looks like, these are families that are, that are in need. And if you're taking advantage of my child and going to make millions of dollars off of my child, then I should be able to capitalize on it. And he should as well. He or she, she should as well. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's really kind of the gist of and then again at the end of the book i really wanted to start explaining the realities and the truth of the things that were left out of the courtroom and so when you allow a, 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 an unjust system and they call it the justice system but it's not just for us and so when you say i've done something i should have the opportunity to defend myself with all the evidence that that i have and that you have you have the evidence i have the evidence but because these judges and these 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 young prosecutors, they really on the same team, then they can manipulate a narrative and, and cause a narrative and convict us on things that aren't aren't true. So so at the beginning, I know uh you after you talk to your family and friends about making the book, and I know a lot of people probably you probably had a, more people tell you not to do a book than do a book. Who was really pushing you or made you decide, okay, I'm gonna go with a book route? Like I need to write a book about it. What's crazy is man, I, I didn't have one person in my circle that I'm close to or, or still close to, uh, they told me not to do it. Oh. Um, everybody in my circle was kind of like, and excuse my language on your show, was like, oh shit, because they knew exactly what I know, what I've been through, what I've experienced. And so the, the concern only was, it's gonna be some real uncomfortable people when you start talking, yeah. right? And so, but again, the tenor and the tone of the book is not vindictive, right? Like if you, if you guys have read it, and I know you have, it's not a vengeful, um dialogue right it's not it's it's a it's a true and, and 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 realistic point of view but it's also a congratulatory one like you guys deserve more yeah there's definitely and a super that book. in this space that they take advantage of you guys should capitalize you should capitalize more now they may be uncomfortable with that because i'm bringing it to light but at this point in my life man i don't care who's comfortable I've been uncomfortable for the past five years. For the people that don't know, and like it goes into the amateur athletics uh, AAU circuit. Um, I wanted the grassroots was a term that um, I I was not familiar with, and I wanted you to kind of break it down. If you could kind of go kind of quick spill of breaking it down, like how deep it goes into when these uh, corporate like Nike, Adidas, and all them um invest in these kids early to these kids early on like right. with the fedex boxes and finding the talent on in these aus and sending them to certain like colleges so, so again it's a it's a it's a trickle down kind of effect in terms of how the system works and you've got the power brokers at the top of the key who or top of the pyramid who have all the resources and access to to, to, to monies and so what happens is these young men and young women um are part of what's called the grassroots network and that term is loosely used for any kid playing at the amateur level you know uh, middle elementary school to middle school to, to, to high school um 
is considered a grassroots level. Um, but there, then there's an elite level that's typically called travel teams. And these travel teams are sponsored uh, by, the, by the major shoe companies. Um, and so the, 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 the focus of those, of those travel teams is multi, multifaceted in that it's an opportunity for them to, to recruit um, the youngest, best talent in their, in their respective markets um, and, and, and create an asset pool uh, and then funnel monies into those programs. Because if you really want to talk about amateurism and all of those kids are ineligible. Because the shoe companies are paying for them to travel, they're paying for hotel rooms for their mom and mom and dads, they're feeding their moms and dads. Like the money is going to those kids and their families anyway. So it's 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 a farce in terms of the amateurism rules and regulations. But anyway, how do they keep um, this under wraps though? Like, because like if you think about cause it, like because they because they all they all operate under these five hundred one c threes, which are nonprofit organizations. The same mm -hmm. way the NCAA operates under these uh 501c3s right and so mm -hmm. you talk about a company the ncaa makes a billion dollars a year and uh, and and 95 percent of that money comes from march madness gotcha football yeah. is such a powerful entity that football doesn't share any of their revenue with the ncaa mm -hmm. that's why you have all these bowl games there's no march madness for football yeah. so until you get into really understanding the business and how this business really works and that's probably why they're afraid of me talking because i understand and know the business and so, but the time is now because of all of these things that I've experienced and gone through, we're going to start shedding the light on how this really works. That being said, uh, to finish answering your question, the shoe companies also have multi-million dollar relationships with these colleges and universities. And so as I'm putting my money into these travel teams in a respective market, the job is then to have those kids who, uh, now accept scholarship offers from the schools that I spend million, hundreds of millions of dollars to sponsor. So if you're a kid in the state of Tennessee and you're one of the better players and you're playing for a Nike, Nike program out of the state of Tennessee, uh, then you, you should be going to the University of Tennessee because you're a Nike affiliate program. Same with Adidas, same with Under Armour. And it works the same way. So all of these companies are, are basically trying to hoard assets to then push those kids to the schools that they sponsor. That's how the system works. Because again, at the end of the day, those universities who are who are sponsored by these schools wear that apparel. That apparel gets sold in the in the college stores. That apparel gets sold around the, around town. That is sold through e-commerce. So they're selling product, and they can't sell product if they have a losing program. Nobody's buying that stuff if you're not winning. And so when you start looking at the again the business of it, you understand that it is a it is a layered and tiered system in terms of how this, how these monies flow from top to bottom and back up to the top. Y'all job is not to tell anybody to where to go. Like, hey, we're not doing that. But you know, you you keep in connection with them, and and you're not influencing them or telling them to go to a school. But in a way, you can stay with them. And these schools are still connected to one. And and like, I guess you ever see, you know how the commercials would say something in a rapid speed and you don't hear them, but they would in a way kind of get you to buy a product back in the day. In a way you would do something Well, you see Nike associated with, like you said, Tennessee or something, this, and you see the check, check, check on all these uh things. Who oh, I want to go to this place. Cause I see it there and associated with Jordan brand them. And then they go to these schools and then the NCAA uh, AA picks them up and act like, Oh, well, we ain't had nothing to do with it. Well, that's and then, and actually that's the part, partly true and partly not true. If you're, if you're working for the company in, inside of that, those walls, then no, your job is absolutely to influence that young man, and young woman to go to your sponsor school. That's what mm -hmm. they pay you for. That's your mm -hmm. job. So if I work for Adidas, my job is to make sure that those assets are going to Adidas schools. Mm -hmm. If I work for Nike, my job is to make sure those assets are going to a Nike school. And then when they become pros, my job is then to sign them to a professional endorsement deal. That's my job. Mm -hmm. And so, so for, 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 the, for the, the NCAA to act like they don't understand or know this is going on or for these shoe companies to say, oh, no, we play by the rules, it's absolute garbage. So from my what one other part, I wonder if you are a shoe company, how I guess it's because you're under contract or whatever. How is it a shoe company can be a violate? I guess if, I guess I'm answering my own company by a question by saying you're on the contract. How is a shoe company uh, violating anything from the NCAA if that's a college thing by just saying, hey, we want you to go here 
uh if you still like because like they can forego it and go straight from the g league to the pros at this point correct so how is the sh shoe company being in violation of ncaa well so so the rules really are you're not supposed to receive any impermissible benefits mm -hmm. and those benefits extend to anything that's on court gotcha. right so if you have if you need shoes to play in the game on court then we'll give you shoes to play on court if you need a uniform we'll, we'll give you a uniform if you need a sweatsuit to travel in for mm -hmm. for your games we'll give you that if you need a book bag we'll give you that right mm -hmm. sure but companies sending millions of dollars of product to your aunt and your mama and your grandmama and your daddy and uncle and everybody in your influential circle yeah to try to utilize that product to then get you to go to their school is an impermissible benefit according to the rules now i think it's great these families are benefiting but i'm just giving it to you in terms of what their rules are right yeah and so to again act like that doesn't exist is garbage and that's how they recruit because again part of part of the 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 company's motive is to have their product on those assets they want to find the next lebron or kevin durant so if i find that kid at 12 13 years old and i can start putting him in my product and all of a sudden i built a relationship with this kid until he becomes a pro he's familiar with me Mm -hmm. He knows my brand. He knows my company. He knows the people inside of our walls. And so now he's more likely to be an asset of mine than I can go sell product globally because he's a global icon. And so, again, if you understand the business and understand how this actually works, it makes a little more sense to you. So, so look, so looking at another part of uh, the college and stuff like that, I know you talked about education. So, where does it fall like, about these kids getting education? Because like a part of the book you were talking about, like a lot of these kids, they might not even make it. They put all this, invest all this money, but they, not, they might not make it. And also they don't have education because a lot of them don't finish college. So what, where do you think uh, that falls in the realm of importance to them about the kids actually getting something to where if it don't work, they have some. Yeah, it's a, two, it's a two way street, right? Because you're right. It's a, it's a, kind of by default system so if i throw a, a pool of money at a bunch of kids that i think are pretty good understanding that 10 percent of the kids that i'm really uh trying to acquire are going to make it that the, the, the that other 90 percent hey man we, we we tried it didn't work out you didn't become the player we thought you were going to be but those 10 the 10 percent that we did get those are the kids that are going to be pros that are going to help us sell product and so, so you, you talk about the educational piece I also talk about most of these young men aren't even eligible to get into these universities without playing their sport. If 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 the University of Tennessee, and I'm just using them as an example because I don't know their guidelines or their rules and regulations, but if the if the if they need a, a 1100 on the SAT and a 3.5 GPA to get into the school, but then they're recruiting this young man who's got a 2.0 or 2.5 and and barely made 800, but now he's he's your starting fullback. He wouldn't have gotten to school if he couldn't run that football. <laughs> and what they do to those kids is because they aren't academically equipped is they stick them in garbage majors. They'll be in coaching education, parks, recreation and tourism management, like all these garbage uh, uh, majors. And when they're done and their eligibility is up, thank you for your service. Get out. We'll bring the next dude in just like you. Now, it was, uh, it was one question. Um, it was one. It was a uh, mark is good um small part now he was sent to uh i think it was the diploma mill i wanted to ask about this um and i wanted a little bit more explanation on what exactly that was i i didn't get exactly what that type of thing was um, yeah so if, if you got have you guys heard of these fly by night prep schools not really mm -mm. okay so basically there's schools that are that, that pop up that aren't really schools mm -hmm. they, they they get now how they do it i, I couldn't couldn't tell you but they pop up, they're, they're kids that are living in a house, they're taking mm -hmm. online classes, and they get a year's worth of education in three months to get them eligible to go to a particular school. Um, and so they're, they're referred to as diploma meals because it's not really a diploma. You didn't really get no diploma. Somebody gave you a diploma and gave you some grades so that you can get your, uh, your GPA up enough to get into a college or university. And these schools will pay some of these, pay these, whoever's putting these schools together sometimes to create them. Now they've since tried to uh, tighten the reins on those kind of schools popping up, but some of them still exist. 
I was wondering what that when you say just sent them out there because I didn't know I I thought I've seen something I was trying to make sure exactly what I thought but back to the um the NCA so what do you feel like it's gonna take to take them down? It, it's it's still it's still indentured servitude. Yeah. Even even with because I want you to th- I want you guys to think about something. They still have to ask can they use their name? Mm-hmm. They still have to ask can they use their image? They still have to ask can I use my likeness? To benefit myself what kind of that's not a capitalist society what kind what kind of shit what where else does that exist where else do i have to ask you if i can use my name what i look like and my abilities to make money for myself nowhere else on earth nowhere nowhere but until uh, and again I, and i and I, I try not to play the race card man but until white folks at the legislative level want to make some changes it's not going to change Cause that's that's garbage. And until people get pissed off enough to say this is bullshit, y'all need to stop this and change this. It's not going to change. They continue to let the NCAA get away with this farce of amateurism. Here's 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 something you guys should look into. They keep claiming amateur sports. Mm-hmm. There is five hundred and fifty million dollars of dead coaching money that's out there right now. Meaning, there are there are coaches that are not coaching who've been fired, who are still getting five hundred and fifty million dollars. That's not amateur sports. Amateur sports is when you got to go sell hot dogs and raffles and wash cars to have enough money to buy your uniforms. That's not the situation that we live in. And so the government continues to allow this organization to operate under the status quo because that's the way that it's always been. Yeah. Amateur sports don't have highlights. Amateur sports don't have me signing tickets. Amateur, amateur sports, sports don't have, don't have It's not a billion dollar business. Yeah, no. so amateur sports don't have travel teams. Amateur sport, they're like, you know, like I mean, like you, uh, I think the E is the EYBL. Like you got leagues and stuff. Like I mean, it's it's a. If I feel like even if you if like you have the the DC has its own team. I think New York has a team. All these teams that have like regions that have all these AAU teams. If you have a specific region that is a showcase the ABCD uh, summer league. You can't be an amateur with your own uh, AAU team specific for a reason. When you have a, a parameter for where, like, you can't stockpile or you got to, you know, like, that's not an amateur anymore. That's a league, you know, like, and you have a you have a specific um, guideline, like you like a five star, you know, like uh, all American game is the top talent. Like that's no longer amateur. If you on ESPN, you no longer like I get I get what Listen, you're man, and we just we just talking about the money that's generated from the kids. We haven't yeah, exactly what these what's being generated in the gambling markets. Exactly. Like they, they bet all and, this like and all these other them. sites where they're gambling goo gobs and money on these college games every week. My friend like, does uh, uh, DraftKings on um college football all the time. But that's my point. And these kids aren't seeing a dime of any of those money being any of those money's being generated, but they're the ones putting their lives on the line every week. And not just what you when you turn the TV on. They they they're literally putting their lives on the line every day playing this sport. And the problem then is when these young men and young women are finished playing their sport, 5 years down the road when they got bad backs, bad knees, bad ankles, Who's paying? The, who's paying those hospital bills? Mm-hmm. Nobody. They they yeah. are themselves. Yeah, School's not right. taking care of this, but again, the train keeps rolling, and they keep making goo gobs of money. So again, yeah. man, until until somebody really brings us to the legislative level, it's not going to change. <laughs> until enough people say, you know what, this is garbage, and we're going to keep putting y'all in court situations until 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 we bankrupt y'all, then then y'all gonna make some change. Do you think that it's like it's like the Brian Flores situation? I know you're a football fan, so yep. I know you, you know you know this one just because they hired Lovey Smith as a like see what we did type He's thing. The one that, that, now they can say we hired one of y'all. Shut exactly, up. but it's it's his whole his probably his whole staff about to be white. You know, mm-hmm. it's not really gonna change it, no. and this is just to discredit discredit Brian Flores. It's not gonna change anything. Like now they're no. gonna be like we got one no. black executive at the Vikings, we got no. one black coach. With two black coaches with him and Mike Tomlin, it's not gonna change anything. I no. think you know, like you need radical things, like you know, and I'm not about to get depth, uh, I mean super in, like deep, like you know, unite fight you, like and say we need like another uh George Floyd incident where you ain't got no choice but to react because you're on camera, but you know, um you need uh I hate that you need those type of acts where you have no choice but to, but um right. 
I don't know until 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 the right person. But you guys are right. It's not just a it's not just a player situation. It's it's also level, right? Eighty percent of these kids at the college level that play basketball and football look like us. Yeah, yeah. There's two. There's there's less than twenty percent black head coaches in 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 NCAA. Less than, and that's because we don't get hired because we're viewed as recruiters. Black guy, go into the black neighborhood, get the black kid, bring him to my white school so white folks can make money. Exactly. Like, uh, it's like, like I said, Donald Sterling only had to give up his team because he got caught. Like, it wasn't, I don't think it was a surprise that he was racist. Uh, no, that's not. You know, but he got caught on tape. And so he, he Same had with to John Gruden, right? Same exactly. Thing he got, he got caught and he wasn't even in the league at the time. Right. Um, and then you said, like you said, uh, you really think the assistant, I mean, the head coach, Rick Pitino, don't know his assistant coach is paying off strippers. Yes. So come on now, like you, you mean to tell me you the head, you think Nick Saban don't know what's going on? Oh, what was his name? Uh, Urban, uh, Urban Meyer didn't know what was going on with that coach. No, um, or uh, what was the guy who he died at uh, Penn State? The uh, paternal. He, yeah, he he didn't know that uh, dude was uh touching them them kids. Uh, Sandusky, ain't that was his name? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't think he knew that and he ain't say nothing? So it's like you, you the biggest person there. You don't think like something like that was going on, you just keep him under the rug. So I like you you don't be that person that known and you don't you don't you don't know these type of things that are going on, but you got it. But you, again, gotta, man, you talk about a system that excuses their behaviors and criminalizes ours when we do the same Oh, of thing. course, of course. You know, Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick was uh vilified, you know. Now the knee is celebrated, you know, right. like so right. it, it I, I just hate that it has to come to like I said, I looked at the story now. All the execu all the executives and paterno were fired. But mm-hmm. again, it was it was so much other stuff that escaped on the rug. And the NCAA plays the the double standard, you know, like this the ineligibility, and we don't do this type of thing, and we play the the double card. Do you feel like uh, how much longer do you think they're going to keep doing the one and done? Do you feel like colleges even really need it? Well, and that's you know that's kind of the relationship with, between the NCAA and the NBA, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of that one and done situation. Again, power brokers and not really wanting to step on each other's toes and to help each other gain, you know, opportunity and make money in business because these kids are, again, they're the, they're the pipeline to make money. Mm-hmm. And the better the product and the more anticipation and hype that can be generated around these high-profile kids that you know are going to stay for one year, um, the better for the NCAA, the better for mm-hmm. that particular university. Gotcha. Right? So, so uh, uh, I, I do think there'll be some some discussion at the next collective bargaining agreement at the NBA level about ridding themselves of the one and done, you know, and, and that's not the, that's not the end all be all. Cause some of these young men will, will make that, make the jump and aren't ready and it'll mm-hmm. cost them opportunity. Right. Cause they're not mentally ready. They're not physically ready. They're not skilled enough, but somebody told them they were ready and they could make the jump. And so they're going to try. Um, and so I think it has to be a calculated risk, but I also think that these young men and young women should be able to capitalize on their abilities while they're still, um, playing at the collegiate level, and here's my my problem with the whole system is you don't stop the the young the young man and young woman that's got a an engineering scholarship. You don't cap what he can make in his internship. You don't tell him how many hours he can study, but you tell these kids how many hours they can practice. Mm-hmm. You so, know what I mean? So it's a, it's a double standard, and 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 the, and the white sports typically aren't scrutinized. In the same way that the the month the the, the uh, revenue generating sports basketball and football, which is us, are scrutinized mm-hmm. because they're not generating the same kind of money. These football and basketball programs at these schools pay these professor salaries. They build all of the dorms. They, they build the, the 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 English and science department buildings. They they pay the the head coach four five million dollars a year. They pay the AD one to three million dollars a year. They pay all these folks, and these kids get absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, so what, what, what do you think would be a, what do you think would be a good start? Uh, what we could do, or what they could do for the kids? Like, what, what, what do you think they could even do? You know, with the system and how everything is, what can even happen to where the kids are actually getting the money that they should be getting? Like, stop, putting have a cap, a- stop putting the cap on what they can earn. If a kid has a chance to go get a sponsorship deal. You know, for goo gobs of money, whatever that looks like for him, cool. But what they do is they're putting a they're putting a band-aid on the bullet mold. So in the state of Georgia, 
they 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 passed a law that says these the, the school can take 70 seven zero 70 percent of these kids earnings and redistribute those monies how they see fit as a part of the name image and likeness deal in the state of south carolina there's a 10 percent cap on the agent agency fees so you're discouraging the agent from going out and getting a sponsorship deal because he's not gonna make any money so it's all these little state by state rules that are really putting it put in place to discourage the business side and the, the young men and women from going to get these opportunities mm. so i know so um, you asked me, okay. ask me so you asked me where to start would be a start would be saying you know what put make these schools accountable to these young men and young women who are on scholarship putting their lives on the line by each year we'll put 50 grand into a trust for you and every year you stay in school and you're eligible and you finish that season we'll put 50 grand in the trust so when you finish you got two hundred thousand dollars to start your life with so I know it's not a lot talk- of money for these schools to make good gobs of money. <laughs> and it might not be that much. It might be 10 grand. It might be 20 grand. Whatever the number is, do something and then give them a piece of the business. If they if they generate $40 million a year from their athletic programs, a portion of that money should be split up between all of those athletes that help them generate those dollars. So I know um so I know we already spent like how the NCAA and shit, but I do want to make sure we get his time to highlight, you know, how Merle went out his way to highlight his character. And I know one of the best parts about the book was that your best part of the job, even though it was business, you always made sure you went out your job to build relationships that transcended that it was not about signing on the dotted line. Um right. Um, I know when you met uh, Lee, you know, you went out your way to give money out your pocket before he started doing what he doing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not about to give out everything of the book because y'all got to go read it. But, you know, when you met uh, Big Ant, Sundays was y'all day. And that ain't got nothing to do with Monday Night Football. Monday Night Football. Monday (laughs) Monday night. My fault. Monday night. You know, that was y'all day. Yeah. Um, You know, when you met Gloria and uh, Brian. You know, you try that Pat Bev was a dog. You know, everywhere you went, um, when you, you know, you were hosting camps, teaching people, uh, the kids in basketball in the city of Chicago, having your camp. Uh, Mark is good, uh, teaching him a Tim Grover. You know, like a lot of things that were like when when ABC and everybody wanted to just highlight this, this whole um, scandal and stuff like that. They didn't highlight any of the stuff you do. And of course, it's like draft day when you get drafted. Oh, such and such gets drafted. Daddy is an ex con, and mama was selling crack and doing hair in the room. They don't ever mm-hmm. say anything else about what you did, but mm-hmm. wanted you to kind of speak on relationships seem to take priority more than just the clients. Because if you look at it, the deals were gonna get done regardless. But you had you were always able to call somebody if you needed it, like with uh with uh Big Murph and Old Miss. A simple, hey, I'm coming down there to see somebody it worked out because you had you was going down there for business but your relationships and building mm-hmm. you was able to help somebody on a team mm-hmm. and it worked out because you had to come down there a year or so later to look at another prospect you know what i'm mm-hmm. saying it was relationships that right. also will end up to networking i'm a big networking relationship person so that's that's why yeah. i like that's why i like that aspect because i've i always feel like that stuff works its way out and i feel like that was something that anything I looked up or anything I seen with your name never highlights, but I, I like I love that characteristic about mm. you that never that was never shows. I just want you to speak up on that. Yeah, no, I, pre- I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I I really have prided myself, man, into not having transactional relationships to have them be transformative. And so it's not about passing dollar bills to each other. If I can help you, and that's what it causes, cool. But that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I want to see you elevate yourself. And as I stated in the book, change your station in life. We're already dealt a bad, a bad hand, right? And so, and so how do we then change that hand into something good for us? And so I wanted to make sure that all of my relationships really had some, some depth and some meaning. And it wasn't just me being able to, to give you some, some sweatsuits or some, some clothes or, or even put some money in your pocket, like whatever that was. It was really more about, hey, man, I want to see your family elevate out of this particular situation. You guys got a, a, a bright future ahead, and I'm glad to be a part of the journey. I'm not going back to, to um, you know, Big Ant saying, hey, man, I need a I need million dollars because this is what I did for you. That's not what it's about for me. It was about really trying to help these young men and, and, and change, their, change their lives. Yeah. 
like the brow the brow situation was so dope i didn't even knew that and a lot of people don't even know the history of the brow mm-hmm. brand and that's so dope you know and um and even the um the it, it was so many more and i i'm gonna fuck around and spoil it, <laughs> you know what i'm saying and i gotta keep catching myself from trying to build up the character what it is you could i'm a big movie person and i'm a big i'm a big story person so i love a big story so i'm sure. trying not to fuck it up you know what i'm saying <laughs> so i'm catching myself from saying it but you are a great person i just say that i hate a bad narrative on a black person because you only get one chance yeah. and as a black man to another black man and i'm currently at a job to where my character has been displayed as something over nine years mm-hmm. and by mm-hmm. one petty ass person has tried to make it seem like it's overshadowed. Mm-hmm. I love how one person can make it seem like you've done nothing. Right. So, um, but I respect that part of you to uh, highlight other people's, uh, highlight your character without it having to always be monetary. Cause if you do something good, people gonna look out for you. Mm-hmm. So the Brow initiative was a great initiative and um the uh what is his name um mark is good was great like i said you drove your ass for somebody did not have to so i, right. I appreciate your character was amazing i just wanted Thank to make you. sure i highlighted Thank that you. i wanted to make sure that the merle code name got that much of my respect and everybody should but i wanted to also talk on um christian dawkins oh so, um the, the thing that did end up sending it was the consultant fee the consultant fee that did that he did ask you to come for that you were already weary of what my one concern for was it um that i did have for rick paterno was the only one that they did end up saying something for but why was it only the assistant and once they had the part where you said the name of the person who you had to get the approval from aka your boss right why did it come down to you i i don't know how to answer that question how did it come down to me <laughs> because well, it seemed I, like you were just I, doing I, your job i could say a part of a part of it was and they were trying to get me to you know uh basically be a snitch and and start wearing a wire and going to tell on other people and i was like man y'all i i, I stated it so eloquently in the book y'all mm-hmm. would eat something i'm not gonna do that like i'm not that dude Right. I'm mm-hmm. whatever y'all gonna bring to me, bring it to me. But I'm not going to be wearing a wire trying to trap somebody else into some bullshit. This is all bullshit. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, when you don't give them what they want, then you become the target. Mm-hmm. And so that's exactly what happened. And then they they are able to manipulate facts and truth um, to create a narrative. And again, they did all of those things. Mm-hmm. And then, like I said, man, I'm 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 at a place now where I'm determined for the truth to come out. And so that's why this project was important. Um, Christian was a young dude hustling who was doing what any other young dude in the business was trying to do. He was trying to build a business. He had relationships. He needed some folks that had some experience in areas he didn't. Asked me to be a consultant. I was already a consultant at Adidas. Then I was like, cool, I'm gonna pay you to be a consultant. I'm meeting with some investors. I go to the meeting. And have you have you seen um, have you seen uh, Wolf of Wall Street? I have. It played out exactly like that scene in the room with him when he was like when he was writing a piece of paper down on the thing and he ain't get it. And it played out like reading it. It played out just like that one part. Mm-hmm. And it was like this is, for him to have been so smart. He seemed so green in that moment. He was 20. I think he was 23 or 20. Might have been 22, 23, 24 years old. And he's a young dude. Yeah. So he hadn't been exposed. And, and a lot of the things that he'd done with these folks prior to, I wasn't privy to. Mm-hmm. I literally got to court and they said, well, why didn't you tell us about $50,000 on the boat? And I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. These are my lawyers. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, he took $50,000 from these folks on the boat. And I was like, I had I didn't know anything about that. Because had I, I knew at that point I would have known this is not how this business typically operates. Yeah. So something is wrong about this. The other question, you know, even like like you said, you can't really answer that question. But I guess the big picture is, you know, a lot of times when they have people wired or tapped or they trying to they're trying to get somebody like they're trying to get a big name. Like right. it couldn't, you know, it couldn't have been you or the guys that they got. So who who were they really after? You know, like or did they ever get the person they would actually No, because initially they initially they, they wanted Rick Patino. 
and initially they wanted Sean Miller. Those are the two guys that they wanted. They ended up getting Wade, Will Wade, you know, on on the wiretaps as well with Christian, who were all discussing business and how they were going to make some offers to some kids. And I had done this and done that, whatever whatever those conversations were. Uh, even my conversation with 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 uh, Kirk Townsend and, and and Bill Self, right? Um, so again, man, you got to understand these young prosecutors need a name to boost their careers. All they all they want to do is bring down somebody big so they can go get a job in in the public sector that's going to pay them two three million dollars a year and leave these shitty government jobs. So they don't care whose life they fuck over. All they want to do is bring down a big name and go get a better job. And then what is it? What is it really accomplished? Because it ain't like it's, it didn't stop the system. It didn't no. stop going Rick on. Got a, Rick got a fucking job today. So does Will Wade. The only one he got, and, and you know, Sean Miller got fired after uh, uh, what two years after after it, but he's still getting, he still got his three or four million dollars a year for whatever it was, you know, for the last couple of years. So these yes. all these dudes, either they they got some public scrutiny, they lost a job, okay, but again, when you look like us, you face you you face prosecution. So I got my my question is, so has any other people that you looked at, and and I respected your. I can't take the, you know what I'm saying? I can't, and I respect it because I probably would have, I've had, I've been in that situation. Like I've, I've had to look out for people that they got family. So I understand you not putting your family at risk for me, but for the people that didn't look out, you know, like, do you plan on like giving them up for the people that didn't look out or you kind of like, when you say giving them up in what sense? So like, are you, are you done with the court litigation stuff? Yeah, are you I'm done. Yeah, okay, so you, there's no, there's, are you like, are you facing any? No, other... I'm, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to report to federal prison Friday. Well, how long you, how long are you facing? I got nine months. Nine months. Oh, okay, I actually got two questions. Um, what can we do to like help, like you know, like what other than promote like book, spread, brother. Promote promote book. Book. and we'll keep um, and we'll keep having these conversations, you know, and and, and then that's that's, that's 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 all I need you guys to promote the book and 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 let's start finding ways to 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 create. An, an equitable and an inclusive dynamic for these young men and young women at the collegiate level. And that's nine months, a, nine months is some bullshit. Like, have you ever thought about, like, you know, a lot of these kids, they don't really have no avenue. They don't have nobody that's watching them. Like, we, you, luckily, some kids did have you and you helped them, mm -hmm. but they don't have you everywhere. So, right. is there like something like maybe you want to put in place or something you think? Yeah, about? We, we, I've started having conversations about creating an equitable and inclusion um, collegiate you know, kind of paradigm to to really find a way to educate these young men and young women on the actual business. Um, and so I think once kids are and kids and their parents are empowered and, and understand the system, then I think we can start making some change. Because so, yes, there actually is some some dialogue about that. Because it makes it makes me think about like so like if I want to go to med school, I can go to a preparatory med school, and that would kind of prepare me to things I can be legal or finance or my schooling. So mm -hmm. I feel like kids that's coming out of inner cities, like you said, like a thousand dollars might seem like a lot of money to them, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So if they had some kind of preparatory program that had them prepare for the college and the business and the Nike and the sponsorship, mm -hmm. they would already be ready. You know, like oh, let's put your money here. So yeah, it's uh, definitely some conversation about it, and certainly there's a I'm lot of layers to it because you know our, our community is you know and i hate to say it this way but our communities have typically been financially illiterate yes and and so we got to figure out a way to to change the, the the dynamic and the narrative in terms of how we accept monies how how we invest monies how we spend monies um and, and so understanding you know what's not living above your means understanding taxes and not getting caught in the owing the government monies because you didn't do the right things with you know in terms of filing your taxes and so we get caught into these situations, scenarios, and, and now that these young men and young women are able to take some advantage of these NIL rules, that's that's necessary. It's necessary for them to be educated, not just in terms of the financial piece, but also the business, and then again, um, the outlook looking forward, and making sure that they're not used by the schools. Don't let yeah. them put you in these garbage majors that you can't do nothing with. Is there um, is there any? Uh, I know you say you don't. Delete. Is there anybody looking out for you when you get like? Is there any jobs or anybody that can still offer you? Oh, there's, you a, like there's, there's, a, there's a few things in the in, in in the works, and so I mean, again, I've built some really good relationships along the way, and um, Adidas, I'll say this: Adidas hasn't heard the last of me. Okay. Um, um, so are you? I know you were talks. I know you said you know like there were some 
are you able to be able to be associated with like the NBA still or is like yeah, that I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing precluding me from doing anything. I don't have okay. any restrictions in terms of occupation. I was just making sure like that avenue, I was just making sure like that avenue was Yeah, like, but I so, you know, realistically, man, I'm 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 tainted and I'm toxic because now I have these federal charges over my head. So I'm gotcha. not I'm I'm not uh, you know, unrealistic in, in the think that the the cor- corporate world is going to uh open their arms to me i'm not unrealistic in that sense especially when you look like us now again if, of course if i look like them it's easy to go get a gig having federal charges yeah I, i'm i'm not that so what i'm going to have to do is utilize those relationships that that, that i've leaned on to to date and, and chart of course forward using some and uh, using some of my own um ideas uh and and so we'll we'll figure it out i'm not i'm not overly concerned about what's gonna happen we, i'm gonna be fine <laughs> What about what about training other brothers and sisters that you know want to do the same job that you were doing, like helping them to you know go to the next level? Yeah, I, don't, I have I have no issues doing anything I can to help young men and young women. No, right? Um, that's a little separate than trying to figure out how to feed my family, though. You know what I mean? So I, I nah, still be open, yeah, open to that. doing whatever I could to be of service from a community standpoint. But I'm certainly going to to figure out how to to to, to earn a living um, in the process. And this book is kind of the first step. Yeah, it was a great book. Um, like I said, any way we can help, we definitely will promote it. Uh, we are promoting. I'm, we are promoting King. Um, that's some bullshit. I didn't spoil it. I did not spoil it. <laughs> you can see my if you can see my screen behind me. I had I had a million things to ask about. I did not spoil it. So uh, <laughs> it will be out in March, people. Do you have the date? March first. Okay, well, technically, I'm going to. Oh, okay. Technically, I'm going to release it in March. So I ain't really got to say it's going to be out in March because I'm going to release it in March. But uh, it is a great book, everybody. Um, when this comes out, it's going to be around this time. We are pulling for you. Um, appreciate it, brother. When you get out, now, um, do you have a. Uh, well, I have your email. You'll have the same email. You got me. You, you know how to get to me. Okay, cool. So I definitely make sure I get in touch with you. I definitely make sure I, like, you know, send update emails and stuff like that. When it comes out, I'll definitely make sure I send this uh, episode out to you um keep your head up man like i said you're a great person um appreciate it brother i definitely read that um and saw bits of like my own character and and seeing how far you made it made me stay positive about stuff i did so you're a great person man like i hate fuck them um, we <laughs> here, so, um i hate that you know they had to do that but i promise you uh you know you shine through better so um keep pushing man great book i know this will do well man and um you're a great man i appreciate you for coming on appreciate this you a nice episode, man. thank you guys man. for having me uh, no thank problem man uh, this, putting this together man thank you I ain't no problem man this has been another dope episode of the eight morning 92 podcast we always keep 100 we gonna holler at y'all later peace back in this bitch uh no we full attack in this shit uh you know the f-